Cry to a channel of light fluid. Welcome back to Burrows. It's not any of his usual places. This isn't looking good. The storms are getting worse. All his tracks will be gone by now. What if he... See this? Calm down. Let's go for everything again. I checked the bar. Sean said he hasn't come in since last week. Ray didn't attend last Sunday's mass either, according to Pastor Brown. Chef didn't even listen to what I had to say. I could tell his attention was... elsewhere. Etienne ran westward. We should probably keep looking here before we regroup. Hmm. There is one place I haven't checked, but what will possess him to go there now? I guess I can't afford to overlook anything right now. Here it is. Just how I remembered it. We used to call it eventuality. It became whatever we needed it to be that day. Sometimes it's a magic cave filled with secret treasure. Other times it's a fully manned pirate ship, the rooftops being on masts and sails. The boys would play at sword fights across the wall, we'd cheer them on from down below, pretending to fire cannons at the enemy forces. When we got a little older, it became Puka Valley. At least, that's what Grey and I called it. I thought it was our little private place until I caught him with Etienne. I time to get over it. There's no point in being bitter right now. We'll snap out of it. We have a possum to find. This is different from how I remembered. Was it always this long? No. No, I've turned left too many times. I should be back on the main street by now. Something's wrong. Wait. That voice. Is that him? Grey, are you here? The sound is getting louder. It's something else. Something heavy. Dragging. Slow. Uh, hello? Whatever it is, is heading towards me now. Run! Get out of here! Keep running forward! Don't look back! These walls... This is a maze! None of this makes sense! No matter where I turn, it feels like someone is right behind me, just out of reach! My legs are tired. These shoes were a mistake. No time to stop! Red light? Someone lives back here. Help! Somebody, please! I can see a door the door the side. They've been thinking that thing had opened and collapsed on the floor inside. Please. Huh? Where am I? Where am I? Oh, this place again. What happened here? The fence. It's all... Wait, why can't I stop walking? Stop, this isn't safe. F please. Somebody, Mark. Ray? I feel myself stirring out of sleep and slowly open my eyes. Still on the couch. And no bloody mess this time. The room is bathed in golden light from the rising sun, and the smell of Mark's amazing coffee is wafting over from the kitchen. I hear him fussing with something. He drops what sounds like shoes and curses to himself. Yawning, I turn over on the couch to face him. Mark? He's sitting across from me, half-dressed, clothes strewn around the floor in a haphazard manner. 
His eyes are worn and weathered. Looks like he'd barely slept a wink, though it's hard to say for sure since my vision is hazy this early in the morning. He notices me and his expression warms immediately. He smiles as he greets me. Ah, good morning, Gray. I lazily rub the sleep out of my eyes and sit up. Hmm. Morning. I sleep well? Yeah, could be worse. I had this weird dream, actually. Before I can finish, he gets up and runs over the kitchen. He grabs the plate just as two slices fire out of the toaster, catching them with the timing of a musician. He starts frantically spreading butter on them with one hand while tossing back coffee with the other. It's somewhat of a hectic rhythm to everything he's doing, like a complex, well-practiced choreography. You're late for something. He stops and sighs, collecting himself a little. Sorry, I have to go back to the office today. They couldn't extend my vacation. Ah. We both stay quiet for a moment. His frustration is obvious, his buttering becoming more aggressive. I want to say more, but I hold my tongue. I knew this was coming. He couldn't maintain his lifestyle otherwise. I force a smile and lay back down and continues his morning dance routine. I'm sure I can find something to do. There's no reason to get worked up over this. Let's see. I can do some laundry. I'm sure there's stuff in here that isn't dry clean only. As that thought passes, a pair of pans gets tossed my way, raping over the couch. I guess I can add tidying up to the list. Anyway, I can be useful, really. I don't want to be a leech. My friends barely put up with it as it is. I may not be great at much, but I'm prepared to try anything. Hey, I'm not trying to be the bad guy here. I feel just awful if you got lost wandering around on your own. I know, I know. is isn't entirely wrong. This city is huge. It would be nigh impossible for us to find each other again. But still, I need some leverage. Hmm. How about this then? Or what? I walk over to the telephone stand and rip a page out of the notepad. Write down the address from the museum. If we ever get lost or separated from each other, we can agree to meet there. Deal? He sighs, looking away with his hands on his hips. I wave the paper at him until he gives up and snatches out of my hand. All right, uh, just in case. Well, if you just do what I ask, I'll never have to find out. He quickly jots the address down along the phone number of his office and hands it back to me. I still appreciate it. Well, don't let me keep you. He leans in and gives me a peck on the lips. I close my eyes and linger there for a moment, taking in the smell of his cologne and minty breath before pulling back. He looks around awkwardly, unsure whether that was the right decision. I soothe his fear by rustling his hair and giving him a longer, deeper kiss in return. Just as I feel his tongue start to poke through, I pull back, straighten out his jacket and patting him on the chest. Have a good day, Mark. We can pick this back up when you get home. He chuckles to himself, having to readjust something in his pants before walking towards the door. You really know how to make a guy's morning. I play with my tail and wink at him, blowing an air kiss towards him. Never stop surprising me, Grey. That's all I love about you. He grabbed his briefcase and slipped out the door as I wave him off. Wait, did he say love? I feel my face get hot and I slap some sense back into it. We talked about this, Gray. He's still a stranger. I don't want my heart broken again. But when he looks at me with those eyes and I smell his scent, I get weak. Maybe... Once things have calmed down, I know what's going on. I can let myself be more comfortable around him. I owe myself that much. I can't punish myself forever. Simone would understand. I let her loud sigh. Finally, I'm alone for the first time since I arrived in this strange place. It's not that I have a problem with Mark, per se, but I'd almost forgotten what it was like to be alone since we'd been glued at the hip all weekend. Back at home, I'd have the place to myself almost all day. 
Simone would sleep in till noon and leave me to my business. Then she'd be out all night singing at clubs. If nobody called me in for a job, I'd see what Etienne was up to. That usually led to... Anyway, well, let's get started on picking up these clothes. I stretch until I feel a satisfying crack in my back, then bend over, grabbing anything that looks like could be thrown in the wash. Anything else I'll fold and leave on the bed. I'll get taken care of once Mark trusts me to take his stuff to the cleaners. Knowing him, it's probably not far from the house. I toss the regular clothes into the washer, and after sniffing myself, throw my own clothes in after. Feels a little strange being nude in someone else's house, especially without them being there. I also notice I'm starting to reach a point of ripeness that even Mark would turn his nose up at, so I decide to get the shower running so I can hop in once I'm done cleaning. It's odd. I rather like my own stink, and plenty of other people I've been with have enjoyed it to varying degrees. Some a little too much. I have a feeling the soap Mark uses wouldn't be strong enough to surface clean me and make a mental note to find something with pure lye next time I'm out shopping. Without clothes weighing me down, I finish tidying enough with ease. I throw everything in the washer, I stop and fish some stuff out of my pockets. Firstly, the white card Virgil gave me. I'm still not sure who I need to give this to, or should I trust anything that the arranged rabbit had to say. Lastly, it was the photo I took with Mark. The only proof I exist in this world. I should really find somewhere safe to keep this. I took them behind my ear and start the washer the way Mark showed me yesterday morning. I wander out in the kitchen and take a sip of leftover coffee from the pot before moving on to tackle the bedroom. Christ, this is worse than I thought. Clothes are hang off every surface, even the lampshade and the seat, in fact. The sheets are barely hanging onto the bed, as if they got caught on his foot and were dragged into the living room with him. Folding the clothes will have to wait. This room is a cry for help. I get he's probably in a rush and fist about going back to work. But this stuff couldn't have been cheap. You should treat it with more respect. Well, first things first. Let's make the bed. Then I'll have somewhere to make a pile I can sort through. I carefully tuck the corners of the sheet back under the mattress and smooth it out with my hands. The soft silk feels good on my naked body, and suddenly reminded of how unwashed I still was. Yeah, I should probably shower before I touch any of these nicer clothes. I suddenly feel the photo slip out from behind my ear. I scramble to catch it, landing flat in the middle of the bed. Well, too late now. I can wash these later. I stretch out onto it. Its firm yet fluffy surface easing my sore muscles. The couch ain't got nothing on this. The window is cracked open and the cool breeze wafts in, washing over my body and catching on tiny beads of sweat I'd worked up. It's been a while since I felt calm like this. There are no pressing matters. Nobody's trying to kill me. Mark isn't breathing down my neck. I lay there for a while, gently breathing in and out while sinking deeper into the bed. Didn't even notice that got hard at first. I have no immediate desire to take care of it. Feels nice just to be hard when I'm certain those days were behind me. If there were more moments like these, maybe I wouldn't have wanted to. And there it goes. Wow, I killed my own buzz in less than a minute. That's got to be a new record. Oh right, the photo. I sit up looking around for somewhere to store it for now. Immediately to my left is a chest of drawers. A few socks are poking out of the one closest in reach and I inch over to it, fishing for the handle. I cut it with my index finger and tug it open, simultaneously using it to pull myself up. Now fully sitting up, I look inside. It's lined with binders and journals on one side, but it has tiny cases for cufflinks and pins. One of these books should be a safe place. I want to make sure it stays flat. I grab the one closest to me and lift it out of the drawer. A tiny piece of paper falls out from between the pages onto the bed. Oops, sorry. I turn it over to see what it is. Okay, now I'm really jealous. Well, he's always been a catch, but he had gay friends help him take saucy photos like this. Wait, class of 49? His birthday already passed, wouldn't that put him at 38? Damn, I was way off. That just means he looks even better for his age. 
Mm. If I'd met him at this age, I'd have... My own erection cuts me off as it throbs against the smooth sheets. Well, I never did get to do it last night. Should I? Yeah, it's fine. I can control myself. I feel bad enough snooping around in here. I'll just put the photo back. Honestly, overbear or not, Mark's a saint for letting me stay here this long. The last thing I want to do is betray his trust. Maybe if I came to hate me, I... I'm caught off guard by a stray tear rolling down my cheek and rubbing into my arm. Don't lose sight of things, Grey. Don't forget him and everyone in the Golden Place. They're still out there somewhere, waiting for you. Take a few deep breaths and centre myself. That's better. Alright, let's put this back where it belongs. My eyes may still be blurry. Which drawer was it again? I grab the easiest drawer to reach. The catch is on something. Maybe a misplaced book? I pull on it harder. A bit too hard, maybe. The entire drawer falls out and over the enthusiastic yank. Its contents spill out onto the floor. Fuck. Well, that's cleaning anyway. Let's see what... Are those sex toys? Well, at least now I know Mark's not strict about positions. Kind of misjudged that one. I bend down and start putting them back in the drawer, try not to linger on the designs. Huh, what's this? Buried underneath everything was a photograph. Even from far away I can tell it's of Mark. I bend down to pick it up and it takes me a second to register what I'm looking at. Correction. It's almost Mark. Another maned wolf. Skinnier, gaunt cheeks, hollow eyes with dark circles and longer hair. There's discoloration on the edges of the photo and it's covered in smudged fingerprints. I turn it over. Joshua. Copy for funeral. Why? Why was it in the drawer where he keeps all his sex stuff? It looks like it was framed from the creases lined in the edges. Why isn't this on his mantle? Did he take it from the funeral and stash it here to hide it? Or is it here because... Dark clouds of red start to form in the back of my mind. I feel like I've seen something I shouldn't have. I should go back to this morning. I should never have come in here. I have to... F fuck. The phone. He did say he'd call me. I slowly creep back into the living room and check the clock. It's only been 40 minutes. He couldn't even wait an hour. I should just let it keep ringing. I don't even know how I'd react right now. Just wait it out. There, finally stopped. Now I can... Something clicks. The box next to the phone? It beeps. I hear his voice and shudder. Oh, Grey? Hello? Are you there, Grey? Are you there? Answer me, Grey. Hello? 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 Hey. I can't take it anymore. I snatched the phone off the hook. Hey, sorry, I was, uh, in the shower. There's a long pause before he answers. I see. Are you all right? Yep. I hear him sigh on the other end. I'm glad. It felt so bad leaving you there. When I get home, I'll make it up to you. I promise. His voice is completely monotone. Was he angry I didn't answer right away? Okay, I'll talk to you later, Mark. He says goodbye and hangs up before I do. I don't know what to do. I hear the shower still running and I turn it off. I don't feel up for that anymore. I don't want to be appealing to Mark right now. Or anyone. I look around. The house is only still half cleaned and I left the bedroom a mess. My heart almost stops when the timer on the washer dings. Right, my clothes. 
I don't feel comfortable being naked now anyway. I finished doing the laundry, dry everything and get dressed. I decided to keep our photo and the card in my wallet instead. I dread the idea of going back into that bedroom, but I can't leave it in that state till know I saw everything. Put everything back where it belongs, including the photographs of him and Joshua, respectively. It's about 10am now. I can't fathom staying in this apartment until 6. I have to get some air. I grab as many coins off the table as I can carry and a spare key from the coffee table as I head out the door. The paper said it'd be much warmer today so I can forgo the coat Mark lent me. I lock the door behind me and breathe a sigh of relief. You can do this, Grey. This may be the future and you may be a fish out of water, but you're still an adult. I ride the elevator down and march out of the lobby. The doorman nods as I walk by and I smile in return. I can turn this day around. I confidently burst through the front doors and out into the open world, mine to freely explore. The sky is a pale blue, I feel the sun warm in my fur, a sensation I dearly missed over the last few days. Winter at Coastal City is no joke. I close my eyes and feel the heat on my face, breathing in the fresh air before taking my first steps away from the apartment. I must have been enjoying it too much because I almost barreled over a mother and a small child. Hey, I'm walking here. You almost hit my baby. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. Yeah, you better be. Okay, sugar pea. Did the scary man touch you? What? TV. Yes, yes, dear. It's almost time for Hogan's Heroes. I shuffle towards the apartment. The mother going out of her way to shoulder check me on the way in. Okay then. I rub my arm and keep walking, trying to let this sour my mood. Come to think of it, Mark never mentioned anything about his neighbours. What if he's friendly with anyone on his floor? Then again, if they thought the residents are like, I don't blame him for keeping to himself. I walk a few blocks, taking my time to observe the locals and pick up on the rituals of the average New Yorker. A lot of it seems to involve shouting. I walk past a grocery store and see a woman in curlers in the bathrobe arguing with the butcher about an expired coupon. He's waving the cleaver around so I move closer to the street out of fear. I don't need a chip in both ears. Right as I move towards the curb, a van pulls up onto it, almost flattening my foot. Some bags a man in a dirty shirt swings open his side door and beckons towards me. Hey boss, you got a free ride down town? Only one dollar, one dollar. No thanks. I turn and speed up my walk. Mark's words echo in my head, but I shake them off. Fuck that. I'm capable. I'm determined. Look ahead and see a bike messenger speeding towards me. He rings the bell furiously and I jump out of the way just in time as he tears down the sidewalk. Christ, you really have to pay attention when you walk in the city. Back in the country, I could walk for miles with my eyes closed, not run to a solve for hours, save the odd critter or two. Me and Simone had a secret tree stump. One we didn't tell him the other kids about. We memorised which toadstools grew on it so we could always find it again. If we keep any treasure we found in there. Pretty rocks, marbles, arrowheads. She was always really good at finding hidden or missing things. Never knew how she knew. She just did. I miss her so much. Damn it. I feel tears start to well up and stop to lean against the wall out of the flow of foot tra- traffic. The city continues moving seamlessly, as if I wasn't even there. And the world should keep turning without me in it, right? That's what I thought when I decided to take myself out of the equation. I was being selfish. Simone's world. Etienne's world. Everyone who I knew. Their world is that much smaller without me in it. I took that future away from them. And now I have nothing left to hold on to except this sad simulacrum of existence. At least I'm not alone. Mark is here. The Mark that hid his true motives from me. The Mark that stole his brother's photo and kept it in that place. I don't know whether he's going to be my saviour or my destruction. I guess I don't have much of a choice for now. God, here I am again, caught up in the ebb and flow of someone else's life with no say, no power. I wipe the last of the tears off my sleeve and slap some sense into my face. 
I do have some power. Looking to my left, I see the entrance to the subway. I have the money Mark gave me. I can go somewhere and come back before he ever notices. Oh, the phone calls. Fuck it. I'm saying the mood for adventure. Let's do something stupid. I peel myself off the wall and head down the stairs into the dark, tiled station. I like the surface world. It's mostly unpopulated down here. My mind is churning trying to imagine how these tunnels were drug without the city collapsing. I wander further until I get to a turnstile. All right, the fair. Fish around in my pocket and pull out a shiny quarter. I try to push into the coin slot, but it's too big. Huh? Am I doing it wrong? I try to use my elbow to jam it in. It bounces off the smooth metal and skitters onto the floor. People are staring. I look up and see a man in the booth tapping the glass to get my attention. I scoop up my coin and shamefully saunter over. Hey, uh, you all right, Pally? Hey, yeah, and never better. I think there's something wrong in that slot, is all. Manufacturer made it too small. <laughs> he looks me up and down. Signs he pushes open a tiny door set in the glass wall that separates us. Out of town, eh? No worries here. Give me that quarter. I gulp and part with my steadfast metal friend, thinking about all the things I could have bought with it back in my time. A few seconds later, the pigeon produces a tiny coin with a Y shape punched out of the centre. Gonna need one of these, Poss. You only take tokens now. Ha, ah, so I can exchange any quarters for tokens. Well, makes sense. I roll my eyes, feign familiarity and snatch my new coin from the counter. Right, happy travels, Pally. I skip back over the turnstile and use the appropriate coin to enter the rest of the station. Step one, complete. I wander around, staring the posters spread along the walls of this porcelain labyrinth. Movie posters, cigarette or fast food ads. Among them I see a map of the city. Wow, this place is bigger than I thought. I wonder what a fun place to go would be. Definitely not Times Square again. My eyes scroll down the bottom of the island. That weird guy earlier did mention downtown. I see an area marked as Chinatown. Ooh, that could be fun. My grandfather used to recount tales he heard from the Chinaman who worked in town for the railroads completed. The culture and attire have always intrigued me. That settles it. Trace my fingers along the lines that mark the train's route from the You Are Here sticker that stop closest to the word Chinatown. Canal Street. Looks like I'll need to take the 8th Avenue line and then transfer to a sea beach bound train at 34th Street. This is kind of complicated. I take a few minutes to count how many stops on my trip so I can better keep track of my route. Okay, let's do this. I follow the signs and find myself waiting on the platform to catch the first train on my route. It's not very crowded so I have a pillar to myself to lean on. Sigh. Mark would be freaking out if he saw me here alone. I can't look a little bad for giving him a reason to worry. You know he's being extreme about it, I don't want to cause problems for him. He didn't pick up. Again. That's the third time. I'm getting worried. It's taking everything in me right now not to run out there and catch the first cab home. I told him not to stay out too long. Why does nobody... No, knock at the door. I compose myself, fixing my hair using my nameplate as a mirror. Okay, come in. Ah, it's Mr. Charleston. What does he want? Yeah, Marcus, doing well today. Instead of answering, I fix the papers on my desk with a shrug. I see, business as usual then? I nod, not looking at him. We both know I didn't come in here to shoot the shit, Mark. Sighing, I lean back in my chair, arms crossed. My investor's been pulling out lately. Ever since you suggested we put that hippie bullshit in our gallery, we've been losing money. Well, I'm sorry to hear that. I'm really not. This is a private museum. Just raise the ticket prices, asshole. This hearty Lawrence Stone is a huge waste already dwindling budget. 
We're going to be considering doing some cuts in the next quarter. Ah, so that's what this is about. Well, what do you need from me this time? He spins around, grinning feverishly. I need you to not bid at the auction. Huh? You think I didn't notice the little stunt you pulled by selecting that piece? Fuck. We finally have someone on the inside who's going to bid on it. Don't interfere. That's all. With a final statement, he turns to walk out, slamming the door behind him. I feel something snap. Oh, the pencil I was holding falls to the floor and I feel the splinters dig into my palm. Ah, oh, man. Something needs to happen to him. My thoughts get cut short as the phone rings. I rush over and almost drop it as I scramble to pick it up. Ray, it's finally getting back to me. You wouldn't disobey me. Well, of course not. Hello, this is... Ah, uh, my mother's voice. My smile drops. I flop down to my chair and try to sigh loud enough that she'd notice. She's asking about Josh's belongings. Something about the bank not wanting to liquidate them. It's obvious the bitch just wants to shove more of his shit onto me rather than have any reminders of him around. I listen more than I respond, agreeing to take it off her hands sometime next month. I hang up and chuckle a little to myself. Next month. The train ride is going better than expected. I've been alone for most of it, and apart from the one oddball scream about the end times, it's been rather tranquil. I don't see what Mark was so worked up over. Sure, it's not the cleanest place. It's not the cesspool he was making it out to be yesterday. Still, I find the entire scale of the city's subway system astounding. I think that had to come for some freight trains we had back in the countryside. I look around the enemy's faces the other commuters. They've likely done this thousands of times throughout their lives. I doubt they're impressed anymore. Pretty sure I'm halfway there now. I'll check the map just to be sure. Yep. Oh, I'm learning this faster than I thought. I remember to gloat to Mark later once I spill the beans about this little detour. I'm going to have to bring up the other thing too. It would be safer not to. If I have to stay with him for the time being, it could be better to not bring it up. Ugh, I hate this. I can feel those clouds creeping up behind me again, but shake them off. No, this is a fun day. Don't think about that. The train comes to a stop. Doors open as the last of the other commuters leave the compartment. After a moment of waiting, with no one else entering the car, the train door shut and I let it sit alone as momentum starts to pick up again. It's kind of tranquil. The rattle of the metal carriage, the low hum of the engine. I lean back on the hard plastic seat and stare at my reflection in the darkened window across from me. Wait, I can see myself again? I wonder, what could have changed between now and yesterday? This kind of reflection is somewhat different, just breaking a weird technicality. <sighs> What's the matter anyway? I'm alive. I'm safe. I stare back at my reflection in the cold glass, finally able to examine myself in real time. I look tired. Lock me up and I rusted over the floor. Right. The same as the nightmare. And here is the last cut in the on either side of me. The wheel suddenly screeched into the curb, the sound of grinding metal rattling in my skull. The rushing wind cuts out from as we pass through a station at breakneck speed. The car starts to fill with screams of thousands of children and stilted voices. I hold my head between my knees, feeling like he's about to burst. 
I grip my teeth when I pull myself out, inching towards the emergency exit. I have to get out. If we keep going at this speed, there's no way out of our jungle. I think I'll wait until we pass another station. This laugh starts to be indistinguishable from the school walls. Okay, I need to do something before. A sudden metallic boom from below interrupts my thoughts. What now? We're slowing down. The lights dim a little and the screams begin to die down. I think we're pulling into a station. Calming myself, I try to look through the window. The glass had become cracked and weathered, as if hundreds of years passed in mere seconds. With some difficulty, I'm able to make up the blurry shape of pillars in the distance with the red light glaring behind them. It finally comes to a complete standstill, followed by a chuff of steam released from somewhere below. The double doors slide half open, the left one being too rusted over to budge an inch. I'm unsure what to do now. It's dark out there. Only a few feet of the tile platform was visible in the harsh crimson glow from overhead. I lean against the far wall and grab my chest, beginning to hyperventilate. I can't even bring myself to poke my head out of that tiny opening. I thought of leaving myself vulnerable, even for a second, has me paralysed in fear. I should have known better. Damn it! I kick a nearby piece of scrap metal in frustration, it skitters across the bumpy floor, stopping just short of the opening. Okay, Grey. Just calm down. Yes, calm down. This is really happening, I'm going to need to focus or I want to survive. We can do this. And I don't think sitting in here will move things forward. So, leave. Maybe just a few more minutes, you know, to gather my bearings. I sit back down and stretch out my legs, waiting for that familiar pop in my knee. Hmm? No pop today. Wonder if that's a good omen. <laughs> the dull ache that usually circulates around in my scars is also absent. Is that an effect of adrenaline too? I shoot up and constantly march towards the door, doing some final stretches. Okay, this is it. You can do this. I inch closer, one step at a time. The room beyond is still bathed in shadow as I approach. Just fucking go. All right. Finally, my foot sails over the gap and I'm... in Virgil's bar. I instinctively back up and slam against the normal wooden door, the knob jabbing into my back. Escape. Now. I reach behind me and try the knob. Locked. Fuck. Stick to the walls. Don't go near the counter. Watch the plants. Kicked something. I cringe as it knocks into one of the cigarette dispensers, a loud metallic bang echoing throughout the room. Crack an eye open. His golden eyes meet with mine. They burrow into my soul and pull forward. He smiles sweetly to me and I walk over to him. My friend. Why was I so nervous? I sit in the bar. Virgil is here. Sight for sore eyes. I nod. I have been having quite the vacation. The big city, eh? I nod. I sip my drink. And you met the dog too. Suppose that's just luck on your part. I nod. 
a huge grin is placid on my face. Virgil is so nice to talk to. Don't do everything myself, heh? I know. What? Mark. I'm here for Mark. He's expecting me. I have to go. I snap out of it, he notices. Feels something heavy on my shoulder. He's pressing down on me with a giant paw. Yeah, I just had to go off on your own, huh? You're hurting me. Of course he is. He's a monster, Grey. He walked straight into its den. Something shifts. I'm being pushed down. Through the seat, through the floor. I reach up and try to hold on to something, but it's useless. I'm thrown into darkness. Wake up. Something hot is starting to burn my whiskers. It becomes too much and I quickly scrape myself off the ground. The faint glow of embers beneath the tile fade away and I'm back in the subway station. Well, his version of it anyway. Everything is distorted and decayed, just like in my nightmare. Tiles are worn into dust and dislodged from their foundation. The red lights flicker menacingly in the distance like thousands of eyes. There's a thick miasma of dread in the air. I feel like I'm being watched. I know I am. Is he actually entertaining himself with this? Wait and see how I respond? Like some sort of game? Fuck that. I start walking. I can't tell how long this platform is or where it could possibly lead to. It's better than standing around. The lights on either side of me glide by as I move, set of three between each pillar. I look up. The ceiling is engulfed in darkness and smooth stone pillars on either side of me tower at varying heights, some so tall they blend into the pitch impossible to see. Don't say it. Spoil sport? Every step echoes throughout the cavernous space, becoming unpleasantly tinny to my sensitive ears. I sound my own breathing is starting to get on my nerves too. This place feels more tedious than terrifying. If it's just some set piece to spook me, he's going to have to try a lot harder. After a few more minutes of aimless trekking, I see the vague outline of a wall, still a ways away. Finally, some progress. I stop to stretch, my back starting to act up again. I never did make time to see the neurologist before I decided to skip town. As I'm leaning back, I hear the faint sound of music coming from my head. Saxophone? Reverberation here is so harsh I can hardly make any distinct notes. Wait, is there someone else down here with me? I squint and try to identify any discerning shapes, but it's still too far away. <sighs> Fine. Steeling myself, I cautiously continue forward. Keep my eyes peeled for anything I'd use as a makeshift weapon. This room continues to be a waste of fucking time and offers nothing. Get close enough to see the vague outline of a person in a suit, I think. They sit on the ground with their back against the marble tile wall, playing a soulful melody. The solo was added into the melancholic atmosphere. It's not quite funeral brass, but it's not jovial either. It's nostalgic. That feeling has been coming up a lot lately. Surely close enough at this point they would see me coming if the performance continues. Shrugging to myself, I force myself to relax and walk toward them with my usual gait, arms in pockets. This person might have been thrown in you against their will, just like me. I stop just short of them, but far enough away that I can get a good running start if I have to bail. I see pretty clear now they're male and some species of goat. They are in a tattered purple suit with no shoes. Most striking is the odd clownish face paint. Finally stops playing and sets his instrument down beside him, tipping his hat towards me. Ah, and what a find it is, another face down here. Just how is life treating you, Mr. Possum? That's a loaded question, an equally loaded answer. I shrug, rolling my eyes, if to say, eh. He frowns, miming crying tears in exaggerated fashion for chuckling himself in the familiar, raspy, wheezy voice of a boozer. What a shame, then. And you were so sure about it, too. 
I give him a puzzled look and he giggles, almost in a girlish way. Yeah, if a girl smoked ten packs a day. His horns can against a tiled wall and he pulls a hand rolled cigarette out of his breast pocket. Hold oh, on, boys give it a land up and a half and he still don't get it. What are you talking about? Oh, maybe a luck penny would make more sense in this case, Mr. Opossum. <laughs> I got what he meant the first time, but how the hell is this a gift? He strikes a match against the brim of his hat and lights up, taking a few puffs before continuing on. Ah, rude of me. I didn't introduce myself. You can call me Mr. Weekend. Bonjour, monsieur. Uh huh. Why do you call yourself that? He scoffs at me for taking another drag. He lets a smoke trail out of his nose and answers. Because it's Saturday every day when you've been in my house. <laughs> Offer's still open, you know. He stretches his skinny hand out towards me and I shake my head, dumbfounded by this whole exchange. No thanks. Right now I just want to get out of here. He sucks his teeth and he recoils, fingers curling back like a snake's tail. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I got some unfinished business up there, of course. Laissez le bon temps rouler, Mr. Possum. But before you go... He tips his head and his hat rolls down the length of his arm. He catches it by the brim and holds it out towards me. Can you spare some change for a humble beggar? Anything would help. I dig into my pockets about the rest of my quarters. The quick glance I have about ten dollars. How much do I want to give him? Appreciate it, Mr. Possum. This tone doesn't seem appreciative at all. He rolls his hat back of his sleeve, money and tone plops it on his head. Well, ain't written no way what the price of happiness costs. Thank you kindly. I nod slowly, unsure of where this is going. So. We're already destined to meet, Mr. Gray. I already knew who I was. I feel myself tense up again. Good to have this guy in his pockets too, for all I know. Isn't all of this his doing? He notices my uneasiness and smiles, knocking against the wall behind him. I only now notice the intricate symbols scrawled on it. <laughs> no, not like that. Way back when. But this time I can't save you. In too deep. Too deep. Too deep. He trails off, repeating the last phrase until it's barely a whisper. For I can react, he taps his knuckles against the wall behind him. The door appears in a flash of purple light. And he's gone. Saxophone too. I'm going to stop questioning every weird thing that happens. This whole week has been weird. Approach the door and stop after hearing faint voices come from the other side. Something about one of them. I grab the handle and push it open, leaving it to the next room with reckless abandon. It's not a dark corridor, nor as dark as the last room. It's lined with rusted steel girders and tiny floor lights dotting the path ahead. I see the silhouettes of two people. It looks like they're arguing. Wait. A tail, those curves. There's no fucking way. My body reacts against my better judgment and I cut my hands to my mouth to yell. Save my own! She turns around and I hear a gasp. It's her. It's really her. But if she's here, that means... Oh no. She turns back to the larger figure, pointing at me. It nods and the two start heading over. Their faces become illuminated as they pass over each floor light. 
Some more looks a little rougher than usual, no injuries. The other person appears to be some sort of avian, though he's still too far for me to tell which. He walks calmly with his arms behind his back, and hears sharp talons tink against the metal plated floors. Gray, thank God you're alive! What are you even doing here? She catches me in a tight hug where I can finish, squeezing the air of my lungs like a tube of toothpaste. B back. Oh, right, right, sorry. She lets me go, dusting herself off. Her dress has a few red stains on it and I shoot her a worried glance. Is that... She follows my eyes and examines herself, sighing in annoyance. No, it's just rust deposits or something. I woke up here after I... She stops, looking like she suddenly remembered something. Simo. I feel a hot surge in my stomach. She sucker punches me in the gut, practically lifting me off the ground with her fist for a moment for dropping me. I fall to my knees, feeling the urge to vomit rise up my throat. Why? Only in pain, I crawl over the nearest corner and face away from them. And puke. The burning in my throat was worse than the throbbing pain in my abdomen. I look back, dry heaving and gasping for air. She only looks a little sorry. That's what gave me a heart attack with that melodramatic suicide note. Uh, I'm... She pulls a handkerchief out of her cleavage and bends down, cleaning off my chin and whiskers. You're expecting to die, right? This should be nothing, then. I'm an idiot. She's absolutely allowed to be pissed at me. Lucky she didn't name lower than my stomach. I hear someone clear their throat behind us. The other guy. I almost forgot about him. So, this is that grey fellow you're telling me about, miss. I look up and see a massive barn owl towering over me. He's rather well dressed, holding himself with a gentlemanly posture. Ian? It's Ian! Who's this? All right, you woke up here too. We found each other and been searching for a way out since. Well, more accurately, she found me. <laughs> Ian, it's me. Don't you remember me? She does that sometimes. She bums into me with her elbow, almost toppling me over again. Uh, what's your name? Didn't you hear me? It's... Enough. Who was I yelling at? Sorry. Ah, no worries. But to answer your question, you may call me Oleander. Wrong owl. I reach out for a handshake and reciprocates, his feathery grip much stronger than I expected from a hollow bone species. Oh, well met, Mr. Grey. Miss Simone was telling me she's been searching for you. Of course she was. With a god-given knack for deduction, it's only a matter of time before she tracked me down. Even if it was to this place, in this time, in this world. You know, you didn't have to do this. She rears up to punch me again, but stops, her fist falling limp to her side. Did you actually want to, you know... I look away. When I wrote that? Yeah, I did. Now, I honestly don't know. She looks down, dejected. Oh. Crap. I place my hands on her shoulders and look into her eyes. She needs to know I'm being serious. Simone, the second I saw you again, I knew I'd made a huge mistake. Even after everything, you risked your life to find me. I feel tears welling up and blink them away. She doesn't hide her feelings from me and lets them stream down her face, make her running. You don't say I love you to someone that many times without meaning it, Grey. You stuck with me whether you like it or not. I sniffle and wipe my nose, giggling the absurdity of all this. I never had a choice, did I? She chokes out a reply, tugging on my chin for her playfully. Nope. 
Oleander clears his throat again, popping up between us. Oh yes, yes, this is lovely, dears. It really is. But we do need to start moving again if we want to egress. We gather ourselves, not in unison. Alright, let's walk and talk. The three of us start making our way down the corridor and exchange stories. It's been everything that's happened since I left the house that night. Only skipping over the details concerning me and Mark's. Maybe romance, maybe friendship. And then he told me, You'll find it behind this door, but the price will be mighty high, yadda yadda. And he still went in? I already told you, you're stuck with me. This girl's going to give me an aneurysm. Oleander is vague about his background. He works for a large company and investigates cold cases and found himself lured in by Virgil too. I believe him, for the most part. He's suspiciously calm for someone in this situation. And he doesn't have any dirt on his clothes. Maybe it's just part of his training? He is pretty built. It's always hard to tell with what's flu from what's muscle with aliens. He's on the older side, too. Hmm. No, goddammit, Grey. Can you not be a whore for five seconds? Especially with your ex right next to you. After a long walk in the path splits into two. Hmm, well, this is a pickle. Is it? The three of us. Pardon? You two take the left, I'll take the right. You can't be serious. We just found you. I sigh and gesture to the owl's massive frame. If something goes down, you're better off with this guy protecting you. I'm used to getting beat up. I'll be okay. That has no logic whatsoever behind it, but it's the young miss' decision. Can't we just explore them one at a time? Splitting up feels like a bad move. If one of these is a trap when we walk in together, we all die. I see. So you're going in for at least one of us finding the exit? Mm hmm. So any sign of trouble, we might make a cure, okay? Uh, who decided you were the group leader anyway? I laugh and put her aside, trying to whisper as discreetly as possible. Sim, we don't know this guy. If he finds the exit alone, he could just leave us behind to die. Oh, so you want me to watch and make sure he doesn't find anything funny? I pat her on the shoulder, grinning with confidence. You didn't get discount your strength after that punch, did you? She beams back at me and nods. Thanks. I'm, s I'm sorry for doubting you. I won't let you down. She walks over to Oleander, hugging his arm playfully. Of course I want to go with Ollie. He's stuck by me more than you. Uh, Ollie? I stick my tongue out to her, followed by a wink. I then nod at Ollie. Uh, keep her safe. He grins weakly, Simone pulls him into the left tunnel. Oh, well do, Mr. Grey. I will then disappear for walking towards my side. Stay calm, stay focused. The walls are lined with hundreds of feet of cable and I trace my fingers along them. Rubberized. This must lead to some kind of electrical device. I follow it for a few minutes before it opens into a larger, brighter room. Standing before the room is a thin metal bridge stretched over a chasm, yellow and black stripes painted along the edges. Of course. Ollie would never been able to make it over this. His talons were spaced wider than this thing even allowed. I gulp and carefully move on to it, opting to shuffle across inch by inch. Halfway across, I feel the metal start to give. I panic and run the rest of the way, coming off right to the bridge buckles under being frozen in the dark depths. I listen, waiting to hear a loud clang when it hits the bottom, and no sound ever comes. Well, there goes my way back. So much for my plan. I turn around, examining my new surroundings. There's a long, and I mean a long, escalator stretching up into a bright light. And it's like this light source this entire room. I approach, I hear the muffled sound of a motor starting and stopping. It's the escalator. Someone's caught in the treads. It looks like some kind of fabric. I see a button labelled emergency start on the console. We consider a longer walk if this thing isn't moving. Should I press it? I 
Let's not mess with anything. This place is unpredictable enough. I take a deep breath and start jogging up the steps. I can't keep my friends waiting. It's not so bad. The stairs are springy and help me propel me up. I can do this. I'm so fucking tired. How much farther this stretch on? It's like I'm walking up every set of stairs I've ever been on combined into one hellish punishment. No, this is the safest option. Trust me, it'll pay off in the end, Grey. Just keep putting one foot ahead. My cars feel like someone's sticking a hot knife through them. If I make it to the top, I'll be surprised if I can ever walk again. Keeping track of time was pointless. After what felt like an eternity, I reached the end. Simone and Ollie were patiently waiting for me, leaning against the railing. Sim! Grey, you look like shit. Thanks. I clapped into a heap between them, gasping for air while rubbing my poor little legs. No, I concur. You took the low road less travelled, it seems. I'm just glad you two are okay. They respectfully allow me to rest for a while. Hot chain washing over me as my lack of athleticism shows through. Eventually I stand up and brush myself off, rejoining the group. So, how did things go on your end? Ollie sighs, scratching the back of his head. Well, we walked for a good long while before coming across even more bloody tunnels. Shit, that would have thrown me for a loop. Indeed, we're not for Mr. Moan here, I would have found our way through. I look at her in disbelief. She just giggles and smiles, looking away bashfully. What? You're ridiculous, Sim. But I'm glad you're both okay. Well, this time wasn't very hard, thanks to you. Huh? Me? She pinches her nose, gesturing to all of me. You've got a very particular odour, Grey. I just followed my nose. Ouch. That hurts, especially coming from a skunk. Ollie pats me on the back, laughing to himself. Oh, sorry, lad, but she's right. Great, the hot new guy also says I stink. Can't wait to hear it from Mark later, too. Look, I mean, running around a fucking sewer and getting the shits get at me every ten minutes. It's fear sweat. Well, it's quite alright, Grey. I've gotten used to it. Oh, we owls have a decent sense of smell, too. He leans into whisper, his beak pressing into the grooves in my ear. And a very good hearing. He playfully nips my ear open, chuckles as he pulls away. I go. So, we heard us earlier. I still went along with the plan. I glanced at Simone, who somehow didn't notice the exchange. Anyway, both paths lead to this area, so the exit must be this way, right? Indeed. Well, I suspect the light is coming from the surface, given its lack of mechanical origin. We can't stop now, then. Come on. She runs off in the long hallway across from us, and we follow suit, picking up the pace in an effort to catch up with her. After a minute of jogging, we slow down to a fast-paced walk. The air tends as we stay on guard. This is the final area, I'm sure of it. The light slowly begins to shift and the air becomes cold and more breathable. Soon the muffled sounds of traffic start to come through from overhead. I go over to Simone and smile confidently. She nods and we walk faster, sensing the end of this nightmare approaching. We come to a ladder leading up the underside of a manhole cover. So we're in the real subway? I don't stop to think about it and gesture for Ollie to climb up first. He looks surprised but not stoically for starting his ascent. I go next, followed by Simone. The orders mostly preserve Simone's decency, but I also don't think either of us could move that cover, at least from this awkward angle. He stops at the top and struggles, fitting his pointed fingers in the grooves and waiting the rumble of traffic to stop before beginning to twist. The muscles in his whole body tense and I hear him struggling. He had a face full of his ass and the fabric of his pants buckles as he flexes his glutes. Oh, great. Would you be a dear and support me from the bottom? I can't find purchase from this angle. Y yeah, sure. 
I take a deep breath and move up a few rungs on the ladder until I feel his thighs press down my shoulders. Yep, it's not just feathers. The guy's built. I much appreciate you, comrade. Let's try that one again. I feel his whole body twist as he tries opening it with both hands, pulling my head between his legs in the process. Are you alright, lad? I stifle out a small moan but can't speak, my face being squashed on both sides by his powerful thighs. Is everything alright up there? I give her a weak thumbs up. He's practically sitting on my back now, his junk pressing to the back of my neck. Almost there. Ha! I hear a clang as the metal disc is flipped and lands on the surface. A bright light pierces into the chamber and the sounds of the city are clear as day. He did it. And that's it for Burrows for now. We will be uh, returned to it before too long. And as always, before I finish off, thanks to all my donors on Kofi and Patreon. I very much appreciate you all. And my top patrons are Burnt Toast, Kartek, Gobiz Vissa, Esuksu, Lark Huskerton, Bastian, Brian Hall, Tiger Cub, Ida Korval, Anubis Silverwind, Dissonance, Grizz, Spiderling, Kopi, Sindri Dragowolf, Nightscale, Big Booty Judy, Omar, Samuto, Andy Peng, Mohammed Al Zamel, Aaron Fox, Exac, Evan King, and Marcus. Special mention to all of them for helping me out. So that's it for Burrows. Next weekend we'll return to Echo of 2020 as we return to Arches. And there may well be something extra in the week for you. We'll see how things go with that. So until either of those, thanks for watching. Bye for now.